Welcome to the Mind of Business Success Podcast. I'm your host, Alicia Kramer. Our guest today is Chelly Phillips. Let's talk about culture and how it can help you grow your business. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Culture. So oftentimes we have these preconceptions our mind loves to have some type of definition for every word. And culture means different things to different people. So let's start by talking a little bit about your definition of culture and how you are helping business owners to utilize a more robust understanding of the value of culture to grow different aspects of their, their business. Yeah. So for me, I like to call culture, the fuel that gets things done because it engages the employees it engages the management and engages your board. If you have one, it's really about bringing everything together, putting it in that melting pot and creating a space where people feel valued in the work that they're doing. And if they feel valued in the work that they're going to doing, they're going to contribute 10 times to the success that your organization is going to have. And so for me, culture really becomes that fuel for how we get things done, how I'm making sure that the people that I'm hiring or in the right positions where I'm making sure I'm investing in them to grow their skills so that they even have more to offer the organization. And then on the flip side, how I'm making them feel a part of the success of that organization, that their skills really matter, that their voice is being heard, and that they're really contributing to that organization and feel like the work they're doing is having an impact. Now, I've personally just gone through this with an employee that I had to let go where it the great some people are great at interviewing but then their behavior doesn't match their initial resume their initial um enthusiasm their initial confidence their initial promises for some people it's just a job and As an entrepreneur looking to grow and to create the type of culture in their business that is going to create raving, happy, loyal clients and customers, you've got to have the right people on your team. So now let's talk a little bit about this. I mean, obviously, and you used used a number. You said, uh, I think, times 10. In terms, yes. okay, that I mean, that's a very tangible improvement that we're talking about here. It really can make a difference. Now, for someone who's just hiring bodies to just have people filling roles, you don't have that culture. And that is going to adversely affect your clients, your customers, your revenue. Um, and usually, as the leader, it doesn't feel good, especially if you are passionate about your business. It just doesn't feel right. It doesn't sit right to have those types of people who are creating a culture. It's just not the culture you want. So now with that being sort of the lead in, I'm going to I'm going to hand the mic over to you because I'm curious. I think this is a, a challenge that a lot of business owners have. What do you do? Yeah, so. You know, Harvard Business Review did a study not too long ago that said companies that pay attention to their culture, and that's all the way from hiring going forward to retaining and recruiting and keeping people engaged throughout the process, are 400% more successful than their competition. So, you know, like if you, if you have a board or you have accountants or something that are needs some tangible, like 400% more successful, that's a pretty good number. And that's a pretty good incentive to really pay attention to it. Companies that I work with that I find are most successful in this actually begin at the hiring point. And yes, there are a lot of people that are now coached very well on how to interview, how to answer questions correctly, how to do the behavior-based stuff, how to do the the star, you know, response for your questions and everything. And so you have to be very discerning in your interview. And we don't always get it right. I haven't always got it right in mind. And that puts us as managers, as leaders, 
inside our organization in a very uncomfortable position. No one ever wants to have to get rid of somebody because, A, that means I made a mistake. That means they made a mistake. That means we just weren't a good fit. Something didn't happen. And that's just never an easy conversation to have. But one of the ways that you can really start working at that from that interview point going forward is to really talk about values. Because values are what make our culture. And in my book, um, I, I actually call my culture formula the value culture formula. And it's having a vision based on values, it's accountability, it's leadership, it's celebrating the uniqueness of people, and it's the engagement that you create. But to get that vision that's based on values, you have to have the buy-in of everybody inside the organization. It cannot be set from a corner office or from some person sitting behind their desk saying, this is what our vision is going to be. This is what our mission is going to be. This is what we want to be known for. Because what happens when you get everybody involved in shaping that and we all agree that there's going to be five values that we agree on, say, whether that's honesty or meeting production or having great customer service or whatever the values are that we choose to determine for our organization that gives us the ability to set design behaviors. And if we all know these are the values that we're going to emulate and these are the behaviors that are going to show that, then we have something to track and be accountable for and start building that culture on. And when you have those, you can also build them into your interview process so that hopefully you can talk about how do you demonstrate these certain characteristics in your previous work or in your life if it's somebody, you know, that's it's brand new to the organization. And, you know, getting them to talk about how they feel about the mission or the value or the, the vision of the organization what does it mean to them? How do they see that their skills are going to impact and how are they going to play a piece in creating that successful organization? Um, and so you have to be very intentional. I think that's that's really the key is being intentional from the beginning when you're putting people into their teams, when you're hiring them, when you're doing all of that kind of thing is that you really have that value based discussion to make sure that we're all on the same page. And a lot of times I see the companies that I've worked with. They go in, well, they have this mission statement or whatever, but they've never, never really thought about the values that are going to get them to that mission or to that vision that they have. So if I, if, if this is what I want to be known for and this is the direction that we're going, what are the things that my team has to do consistently on a daily basis? How do they have to show up so that we can get there and do that? And then when you have everybody on the same page, they've all agreed to the same things. They say these things are important to them as well, whether it's honesty, transparency, whatever that you agree on, then everybody's headed in the same direction. And they all have something that they can get behind and say, I'm going to demonstrate this in my daily behavior. And it makes the work environment for everybody something that they've all agreed upon and that they all know the expectations going into it. It's so it's so genius and yet so simple in a family unit what makes a thriving harmonious family unit it is sharing values if and and I see this in my own family you know if somebody sort of crosses the line a little bit someone else is going to chime in and give them a friendly reminder mm -hmm. <laughs> right? because you're all sort of synergistically harmoniously together on that I think that for some of our smaller business owners, maybe the solopreneurs, you know, they have maybe an assistant or a couple of employees, they have a habit of thinking, oh, that that's only for those corporations. That's only for big businesses or even medium-sized businesses with like 20 employees. But that's not entirely true. And we need to set a foundation as well. So let's speak to that for a moment. For those individuals listening who are thinking to themselves, well, that's nice. And maybe in a perfect world, if I ever build my business to where I have, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 employees, then I can sit down and I can write out the mission statement and I can get clear on my values. No, wait, 
So let's talk a little bit about why they shouldn't wait, what they can do at this stage and how it's going to positively impact them here and now, as well as what they grow into. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of times I think entrepreneurs or solopreneurs think, just like you said, that this is for somebody bigger. This is for somebody that has, you know, a bazillion employees that they have to deal with. But the thing is that if you are start now, as you grow your business, this culture is going to grow with you. And if you have just one other person, you and that other person sit down and say, this is what we want to be known for. This is what we want people to think of when they think of us. And how are we going to get there? What are those same values? If I had a team of 20, what are the things that I'd want them to be doing every day, getting ready for it? Well, I may not have a team of 20 right now. It's just the two of us. All right. Maybe it's a part-time assistant in you, but you want that person to be emulating the same thing that are important to you. When you started that business, you started it for a reason. You started it because you were providing a service or you were providing a product that somebody else wasn't doing or you thought you could do it better than somebody else was doing it, whether it was in quality or whether it was in customer service or it was, you know, whatever the reason was you did it, you did it because you felt like I could do this better than what's being done right now. And it's something that the world needs. So, you know, to me, we start celebrating that in our individual culture, because there's something in us as entrepreneurs, as startups, as anything like that, that there's a fire in us that wants to make sure it keeps going and it's growing. Well, how do we do that initially? Well, we have to be a successful business. We have to make sales. So how do we do that? We build that community around us, whether it's in our suppliers. We have expectation for our suppliers. We want to make sure we get the things to us on time that we need. It's also in our buyers and in our customers because they expect a certain level of treatment. And then therefore, when they get that or when we exceed those expectations, they're going to tell other people about what a great experience they had with us. So culture becomes that word of mouth that if you do business with XYZ, then this is how you're going to feel and this is the treatment that you're going to get and this is the product that you're going to receive and you're going to enjoy the experience so much so that you want to do repeat business with them or you want to tell your friends and family about them so that other people can do business with them. So that culture becomes an extension of the community that you're putting around you. And to me, I think it's so smart for people to start thinking about that from the very beginning, just like you have a basic business plan for, okay, this is what I'm going to need to do. This is how much money I'm going to need to have in the bank. This is how much marketing I'm going to need to do then you need to have a culture plan to start that out as well. And right now it may not be that, you know, the, the hundreds of employees that you have, it could just be you and a virtual assistant, or it could be you and a part-time worker. It could be you and one other full-time person, but you want the people that you're surrounding yourselves and that are doing the business with you to share the same beliefs and the same ideas that you feel are important and that you want your customers and everybody to experience as well. This really does start with us getting clear on our own values and the vision that we have for our business, how we want our clients and our customers to feel. There are probably a lot of different things that we can explore to get clear on those values and that mission. Do you have any tips for an individual listening who is it's just clicking and they're saying to themselves, who I have been definitely missing this piece. Uh, any tips for how they can begin to clarify within themselves what these values are? Absolutely. One of the big things that I do with leaders is to get them clear on their personal brand. And what that is, is like, you know, we're our biggest asset. We are actually, when we own a business or when we manage a company, we're selling ourselves in some kind of role, whether that I, I, I am capable of doing this, I'm capable of creating this product, or I am capable of managing this team of people to get these things done to meet some sort of expectation. So, so what you have to do is become really focused on how do you want to be seen as you operate in this business world, whether that's as the owner or whether it's just someone that's managing day-to-day -day operations or whatever it falls out on. And so one of the things that I really like for people to do is start doing some internal focus first is how are you living those values that we talk about wanting 
other people to see in the work that we're doing and have that real, you know, sometimes it's one of those hard talks to have with yourself is like, okay, I say this, but am I really doing it? And, you know, one of the easiest way to do that is ask five people, you know, maybe not your best friend, unless you have that friend, that's really the truth teller. That'll just tell it like it is, but ask five people, whether they're in your work world or they're in your personal space or have a mix of them. What, what are the things that you think of me when you think of me in business? And see if they align with what you want to be known for. Super easy. Doesn't require a ton of investment on your part other than your time and your willingness to, to listen to what people have to say. You can shoot them an email even and get that back. And, you know, some people are very surprised at what they hear back. Some of them find out that people think of them differently than what they thought. And that's not always bad. It, it may be eye-opening is that, well, I've never thought of myself as that kind of person, but that is a really great thing to be thought of, and I need to to live into that more. It doesn't necessarily mean you're doing anything bad. We all have blinders on when it comes to ourselves and how we know, how we see ourselves. And, you know, I tell people all the time, especially women in business, you know, when I'm standing in front of the mirror, so I, I wouldn't talk to someone I dislike the way I talk to myself in my head sometimes. So why do we do that to ourselves? So this can be a great reaffirmation thing as well to see what the world thinks of you in that business role and how you're living that out in that leadership role. And then you can get very clear. You can do your own kind of mission statement for yourself. How do I want to proceed in this business? What do I want it to be known for? How do I want my employees to relate to me? How do I want my team to feel about being part of this organization? And what are my markers for success when that comes? So you can build your own success branding statement. Like, I, you know, like you were building a mission statement for an organization, but you can do it for yourself as the leader of that organization as well. And I think it really helps you begin to clarify how I want to show up and how I want to be seen. And when you get clear on it, it makes it so much easier for you to relate that to others and have those same expectations in them, no matter the size of the company that you have. This is so powerful. And I'm sure many people listening have had this experience, whether it is when you're hiring an employee or you are choosing a new vendor or it could be any number of things. When we go into something with a lack of clarity, the results will reflect it. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes, especially those of us that are really go-getters, which is a very common trait for entrepreneurs, you just want to jump into action. And so you don't take the time to clarify some of the most critical, important pieces. You think, oh, well, I've got a general understanding of what it is that I want or need. And so that's good enough. And, you know, I'll just sort of sort it out as I go. And when that, when that action has sort of the fruit, right? Uh, <laughs> it's usually not the fruit that you wanted. So, for anyone listening who has been sort of half-assing, um, <laughs> clarifying these things, I think that this is a very valuable exercise and it does require self-discipline and it requires self-honesty. And some people don't want to deal with those things. Some people are terrified of that idea of reaching out to five people because their self-image is mm -hmm. not so good. And that is where we've got to, you know, spend some time on the inner work. But I think that this exercise for somebody who is ready to really get honest and um, get clear I mean, is such a such a powerful process. Yeah. So, you know, the A in my value formula is accountability. And accountability is not a one way street. It's not what you owe me. I like to tell people when I'm working, you know, with companies that are working on culture building or working with their leadership teams and stuff like that is accountability is what we agree that we owe each other. And if you look at this as part of that, is that, okay, I'm saying that if you work with me, this is what you're going to get. But I have this expectation of you as well. And we both say, okay, yes, I'm good with that then we're both accountable at that point in time. It's not it, it it's not that one-way street that I'm just lording over you or whatever. That relationship becomes more solidified. And people like to work places with people that they know that see them. 
And so you as a leader will be a more effective leader when people see you the way that you want to show up because they begin to trust what you say. They begin to trust the information that they're given. They're beginning to trust your leadership and will follow you in the directions that you need to go, which is what we all want as great leaders is like we want our employees to have that relationship with us where they feel like we're on their side, we're their advocate for them, and we're all pulling in the same direction to get things done. You cannot do that if you're afraid to look at yourself inside. And that's a hard step for a lot of people to take. And, you know, it's something you, know, you don't get taught that in business school, you know, it's, or you don't get taught in college as part of your business curriculum or anything like that. It's, it's something that you kind of learn on the job that so much of what we do in the workplace is about relationship. And that is the core to building great culture. This is a powerful conversation. And I know that there are is a lot more depth to this that we could go into, but I want to segue. I want to talk a little bit about your book for a moment. Can you give us the highlight reel, if you will, give us the the book summary uh, and tell us where, you know, where we can get a copy as well. Yeah. So it's called um, Culture Secrets and it's creating a value culture. Secrets leaders can use to create a value culture inside their organization. And so the, the book is kind of in three parts. It's an overview of culture, what makes great culture, what, you know, like how to start looking at it. And then it breaks it down into the formula that I talked about, the three, the, the five letters of value, vision, accountability, leadership, the uniqueness of your employees and engagement. And if you do all those things and you put them together, then that's how you build a very solid culture. And then the last piece of the book breaks down, it's kind of case studies, basically. Um, you'll find global uh, a global automotive company uh, that works for an automotive company production, uh, how they do that on a global scale. Uh, there's an entrepreneur in there. There's a nonprofit in there. There's um, several different kinds of organizations that what I loved most in doing these interviews with some of what, what I consider great culture leaders is their willingness to share all the stuff that they tried that didn't work and then, you know, how they moved on from that, because, you know, that in itself to me is, is, as leaders need to be able to share our fails as well as our wins, because people learn and grow so much from hearing what didn't work as much as we learn from what did work. And so having the different pieces in there and having the real life examples from Panasonic or WD-40 or some of these well-known organizations and even some smaller ones like King of Pops, which is a... Um, gourmet popsicle entrepreneurship that's that's very regional here in our area southern kind of kind of thing is that I think anybody can find some type of organization that they'll relate to in this book and I think if you go through it and you read it and you put in these principles you can see how they can scale for something that's a global kind of process like Panasonic has or something that works for an entrepreneur. And it's, it's, it really is a matter of scaling based on how many people you have involved, what you want to be known for, the reach that you want to have. And the thing that I, I want people to take away is that culture is unique to each organization. I couldn't walk in and say, your culture needs to be this. And go to another company and say, you need the same culture that this one has, or you need the same one as your neighbor down the street. Because culture is very much individual to the organization. It takes in our personalities. It takes in all of our life experiences, what we bring to the table every day. It takes in our business goals. It takes in all those metrics, and it combines them all in a big mixing pot like we were making chocolate chip cookies. We put them out. We bake them up. And this is what we get for our culture. And the thing is, is that it's something that can have a massive impact on your organization, on your people, on your productivity, on your profitability, but it is something you have to be intentional about. Bad culture can happen just as easily as great culture can. If you don't focus on it, you don't weed out the things that need to be weeded out. If you let it just kind of fester and think, oh, something will take care of itself, you can have a bad culture and that will impact your bottom line as distinctly as having a great one will improve it and make it so much more brighter in the future. So I assume they can get the book on Amazon 
and yes. mm -hmm. uh, possibly on your website? Yep, both places. Amazon has it. Um, any of the the big book sellers, Barnes and Nobles, all that kind of stuff, you can get it through there. And it's also on my website, which is chellyphillips.com. Wonderful. Is there anywhere else that you would like to direct our listeners to as we wrap up here? So one thing I would say is on the website, if you're there, um, there's a there's a podcast. I'm not a podcaster. I don't do yearly episodes or anything like that. But what I did was I took the interviews, some that we couldn't fit in the book, some and everything else. And so you can hear directly from some of these culture leaders, hear them tell their stories, some parts that I wasn't able to include in the book just for length's sake, and then some stories that just had to be cut because they didn't fit and whatever, but they still had some great messages. So you can go through and find the people that really and hear them tell the story themselves. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is I have a great free resource that your listeners are um, totally welcome to use when I was talking about that self-reflection piece. Um, if you do chellyphillips.com backslash brand guide, you can download a, um, a PDF worksheet workbook that will walk you through creating what are your values, what is your branding statement as a leader, and it will set you up to begin to have these discussions with your team. Awesome. I want to thank you so much, Chelly, for being with us today. Has been a great conversation with a lot of valuable takeaways. So I definitely appreciate having you on and everything that you shared. Thanks so much. It's been a treat to be here. And um, I look forward to hearing from your listeners how their culture is growing and improving. Well, got to thank our listeners, right? Absolutely. You know, we're doing this for you. If you haven't already subscribed, make sure you do so. And until next time, we will see you in the next episode.